esperando tu llamada y desde entonces dijo, mi papá no me quiere. decided to make a film when 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 at what moment you decided to you wanted to make a film about your own story and your family's story um everything started in 2012 um two years after my father was killed and what brought this film it was that during the years that we live in mexico particularly at the northeast where I come from, from Monterrey, between 2008 and 2012 with the violence because of the narco-traffic. That was, that was a moment that, it was, that hit us to my generation because we had never seen something like that. And it was this moment where none of us felt safe, you know? Uh, I guess that is kind of similar to what we hear nowadays that women have been facing for many, many, many more years. Like, if you don't feel safe at any time of the day, get at any place, because you could be shot, right? Um, so what I was hearing in the conversations with my friends those years were like, the government wasn't treating the root problems of that war, that it was just like sending the army to the streets was just like trying to solve the problem from the, like, I don't know, the, the, not even the la maleza or lo, lo, lo general or um, like just the cover of the of the problem, but it was not solving the problem. And I wonder, like, well, what are those root problems? I don't know. I just remain silent during that conversation. So two years after my father was killed in 2012, I went back to Tijuana. I was feeling in a very steady situation uh, with myself. And I saw the members of my family, my grandmother, my, my sister, my brother that back then was alive. And I just had a fear. Like, like that's what my friends mean. Like these root problems is like the lack of education, um, the lack of support to women, um, especially in Mexico. Uh, and this absence of men that is so normalized where women when they left and then women cannot um, give their kids the opportunity because they, they, they left their studies or they don't have the economical support and at the end it's like the kids who also need that support or to need to, to, to they aspire to go to school, they can't and it's, like, it's just like a cycle, right? And I thought like I've, and back then, 2012, we were still facing uh, consequences or sequence of the drug, of the narcotraffic war. So I thought, I think that it's worthy to put this conversation over the table because what we heard in the news, what it was internationally show was like, yeah, the extreme violence, but nobody was talking about this. So I thought, I want to put this conversation on the table and I think that if I make a very personal film about family, it's going to be more universal and people is going to be able to relate to these causes and to these characters. So that's what happened. I thought that it was going to be quick. <laughs> uh, I thought that it was like, yeah, it's going to take me like two years. Like even my first advice would laugh at my face and say like, it's going to take you at least four. And it took four, it took nine years. Yeah. And how difficult it was to get the family talking about these issues, and more so in front of the camera. Can you repeat it? Like sell it, sell it, sell it? No, uh, how, did, uh, how, how, how do you get to the, your family members to open up, to talk about these issues and get in front of the camera? It was a process, but yeah, it was a process for sure, because I was very naive beginning when I decided to make the film, I thought like, everybody's gonna want to make this film with me. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously that didn't happen, right? I mean, my grandmother in particular was like, I don't want you to do this film. 
my mom was scared mainly because she thought that I was, everybody thought that I was maybe putting myself in danger uh, for trying to tell this story related to these subjects because they thought that I wanted to make something more um, journalist, uh, talking about criminal aspects. So that was a worry for her. So at the beginning, she was like, no. My brother, who was lived back then, he said, like, I don't want to be part of it. I'm not going to be part of it. Um, and then I just got the support from my sister, from my sister-in-law, who appears on the film, and um, my uncle and my grandfather, who I met just when I started the development of the film. So I knew that I was going to convince them. I knew. Um, my grandmother was the last one that I convinced and actually it was a strange dynamic because she was the first that was like no but she was the first the first one that I filmed that I shot and I was like why is she saying no if she and but she at the same time she's letting me film with her and one of my an, an aunt who doesn't appear on the film told me because she thinks that you're gonna do something else with that material because and in another way I had an easy access because it's the the main job as a director of a film, of a documentary director, is to get the access right to your characters and getting them like to trust you and to be honest in front of you. I got that access in the moment that I decided because they all knew me as the geek with this camera all the time. So that was nothing. That was that was that was not new. That was not, that was that, that that was a new for them. Sorry. Um, so access I had it um but yeah that, that was I think it took just that complication I mean to, to, it took time to just make them see the kind of film that I wanted to do when I told them like it's not a film about criminal it's this personal portrait about him and intimate it's like and I showed them some of them I showed them their parts even though they, it says that it's ethically or as a filmmaker they say like you shouldn't you shouldn't show them what you what you want to show them about them because you put your material in compromise. But I felt like, I don't care. I'm <laughs> gonna show them. I'm gonna show them. And when they saw what I was trying to tell, they agreed. Can you talk about um, the Juan Rufo reference? The film is named Comala, after the town where uh, the famous Mexican novel by Juan Rufo, 1955, uh, Pedro Paramo, happens uh, about a man looking for his father in a ghost of towns. When, when do you have the when did that reference came into the project and and what moment you decided to name this the film? Was it from the beginning or was it through the process? It came the same day that I decided to make the film. And actually that was, I think that Pedro Paramo was one of the reasons of why I wanted to do it. Because when I was traveling to Tijuana to meet my family, I wanted to do a fiction because I come from fiction. And I thought I'm gonna, I was gonna apply to a scholarship to write a fictional script about the death of my father. Um, and then on the airport, on the airport on my way to Tijuana, I thought like maybe I need to read some literary or book reference for my proposal. And I remember that the flight had an scale. Is that, is that the term in English? Like a stop? A stop. stop. As a stop. Um, it was Monterrey, Guadalajara, Guadalajara, Tijuana. And on the stop on Guadalajara, there was a bookstore. And I thought like, yes, yes. And, and I read Pedro Paramo in college. And I thought like, yes, yes, I'm gonna reread Pedro Paramo for my application to this uh, scholarship. And it was real for me because I was there me, uh, meeting my family members that I had had many years of not seeing them. And I just saw them in each character of that book without any difficulty. It was not like, oh, who could know? It's like, oh, you're, 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 you're this character, right? And that was shocking for me because it was like, how are, it's like so connected to the reality, even though that Pedro Paramo was writing like 50 years before, more, say 60 years before. And that was like, wow. And that the plot came is like, you are gonna be this character that is gonna make this journey to make this voice of car this choral, choral, choral or this uh, or choral, choral group or choral voices, and it's like Pedro Paramo, and it's gonna call Comala. 
in this in this film is not gonna be in one place, it's gonna be many places, but the important is that in each places relies part of your identity, like in Pedro Paramo. So that's where it comes from. No, but a lot of people don't like the name, okay. <laughs> I have to say, even when we were about to premiere the film, uh, the the artistic director of Toronto told me like, have you considered it to change the name to something a little bit more commercial? And I consider it, and I consider it, you know, like, I was like, yeah, man, he's right. Even though that for many years I defended like, no, it's gonna be Kamala, 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 but I thought about it. But then at the end, like some friends talked to me and I said, what are you talking about? Like, it's Kamala, it has been Kamala, it's great Kamala, it doesn't matter, and I left. Okay. Well, I would like to add something, <laughs> because, because that, I mean, this year we have been moving the film through many places, and in particular one in place in Mexico, and we show it in Colima, which is, Colima is the state where the, the real town of Comala is. And one guy came after the, the, the Q&A and told me, I met Juan Rulfo, you know, the writer from Pedro Paramo, and I am from the guy who was born and raised in Comala. So he met Juan Rulfo and he told him like, you, why do you name uh, the town like that? Because it's very different. It's like, oh, because I like the name. I like the name, but I know that it doesn't have nothing to do with the real Comala. So at the end, he said, like, you you are fine by naming the film like that because Comala is for everyone, like, it has a meaning for each one of us. So, okay. Last question before we open. Uh, so it seems you had the film very clear from the beginning. So in that sense, how was the editing process? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, it seems like I had the, the pretty clear idea about the film, but that wasn't true. Uh, in general, I had it, but then this was my first documentary. This is my first feature, and I knew nothing about documentaries. I mean, I was like, yeah, for me, a documentary was like the National Geographic films about box and that was for me a documentary where you follow someone 24 hours a day. So I, I entered to this with that idea, but then when I was entering in the documentary industry and watching more materials, meeting more filmmakers, you saw that there's like a lot of possibilities, right? And so those questions come to my head like, okay, what, how am I gonna work this? How am I gonna structure it? Uh, yes, I had like the general idea of the film, but I didn't know how it's gonna really ensemble the whole piece. So that was um, that was a whole challenge for sure. With some characters more than with another. For instance, with my grandfather, his part was like, shot it in a month, less than a month, and then like, you know, in three weeks, I edited his whole part. And I think that that's mostly like, we work details and more things, but with him it was like, it was easier. Um, with my grandmother, it's almost, almost the same too, but in general, that was, that was difficult. I mean, I spent many years and at the end, many months to get to the final cut. And the, the, the more difficult part that was the most, that was, the last thing that I get to conclude was how I was going to show myself. Uh, because I didn't want to fall in over the over aesthetic or like, I wanted to be true, I wanted to be honest, but I wanted to be concrete at the same time. So that took me some time to open. <laughs> Questions or comments from the audience? Really very powerful. and. I'm curious about um, about the storytelling. It was really fascinating how you sort of layer with the voices of the different characters, and you have um, you know audio and other characters reacting to hearing the audio, or the, you know, your sister playing on the video with you in the room. And I'm curious at what point that technique entered into the project, and um, you know what you would say about using that kind of layered voices um, as a way to tell the story. Thank you. Well, I have to add that Catherine knows me. She's my friend. I didn't pay her for saying that. Uh, but we, but she saw a first, uh, one of the first versions of the film because we were together in this residency and I was working in Comala. That was five years ago. So 
So thank you. Um, actually, it came after Gary. In 2017, I did this uh, workshop in Doc Montevideo. It's called Doc Montevideo in Uruguay. And there is this brilliant teacher that I love and that it has support a lot of Latin American filmmakers, uh, Marta Andreu. So I, I, I suggest you all to go with her if you're working as a filmmaker, if you're working documentaries, like you should meet her and show your project to her because she made me see that I was taking, when I was editing and trying to structure, I was making this television structure where you don't think about time or space, you think in terms of information. And that's how you tend to construct a television. She said like, you are making a film. This is a film. And you, you need to think about terms of time. You need to think about terms of space. And she just, she destroyed the code that, that, I, that I arm on the carry. She destroyed it. <laughs> but she gave me all the tools to reconstruct the film from this perspective. Like to think, okay, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I am telling a story with concept of time and space, right? So, and I start to, she gave me a lot of references, like look this, look that, and it's like, okay, so how can I make, how can I use these terms and, and be faithful, of, well, keep the material that I already have in art, so that's what I come with those ideas of like, well, show them the material, use it as a projection, uh, use the testimonies instead of showing them in front of the camera, use it more as a voiceover. Um, and I thought like, well, this is more cinematographic. So that's how I got it. Thanks to her. Otherwise, I don't know what I, what I would have. Two personal observations and how relevant for other people. Uh, one was uh, your mother, Sayura, all these characters, either beauty, their uh, kind of luminescence was really a driving force for the film for me to realize that your mother had so much going on, so much love inside her. And the other was just the experience to be here tonight and to realize that you had grown. What a wonderful observation for us. Thank you. I agree. I mean, one of the things that also were attractive for me to make this film was that I saw that in each member of my family. I knew that all of them were charming and I knew that. And I thought like, I'm so lucky. <laughs> I'm so lucky to have all these cast for so way to, set, to, to, to name them. Because yeah, it's easy to relate to them because they are, they're funny. They have this light personality and you, you connect with them, no, as I did. And it's not because they're my family. It's like, I mean, with some of them nowadays, it's like I have some distance, but I can recognize how charming they are, all of them. And I know that as a spectator, it's easier to see that. Uh, congratulations also on the camera work. Uh, sign of a successful production is that you forget there's a camera person in the back seat or wherever in the vehicle or wherever in the room, and you, you totally have removed that notion because you made the film so personal so could you go could you explain some of the camera techniques that were done in the movie it's amazing thank you thank you i enjoy this because some some colleagues told me like mm, the camera work in your film is not that good and like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like well the audience says something else you know <laughs> um well at the beginning because i had no funds when i started this film and i did big part of the shooting there, it's mine. Yeah. But it's also a thing that also needed to be that way, right? Because uh, you get that accent mm -hmm. to these characters. Like, like, it wouldn't be the same if I would take a crew of maybe another four people. I don't know. Uh, so most of that, I mean, with my grandmother, most of the, the yeah. Um, but I had to bring someone because at certain workshops, people were telling me, because yeah, I did the shoot by myself. And I didn't shoot much of me because also shooting yourself is really complicated. You think like, oh, this light is so beautiful. I'm gonna shoot something with me. And when you're done with the focus and all that, it's like, oh, the light went. So it was like, it's, this is not gonna work. But I didn't, I didn't shoot me. I did. I shot a cut, 
with all of the characters there, most of the characters there, not all of them yet. And colleagues were starting to tell me like, we need you there. We need you there. I mean, they didn't specifically say we need you there in front of the camera, but we need you. But I read that they needed me in front of the camera. So I thought like, I need to work with someone that, that can film me. So I started to work with this colleague, Ivan Garcia, with who I previously had worked in other stuff like uh, television shows or um, TV spots. And he also came from documentary. He made this beautiful documentary called Flores para el Soldado. Um, and I, I, he wasn't that close to me, but I thought like, I think I can work with him. So I, I brought him, I showed him the cut that I, that I, that I had. And he said like, okay, we're gonna keep, I mean, we're gonna keep the style that you have been doing with natural light, I mean, with what we have, and that's it. He integrated some, a few lights, lights. The first scene that we shot uh, was the last scene with my mom. Uh, and Ivan was, I mean, oh, well, Ivan was really moved, you know, at the end of the day, he asked me, he thanked me, like, you know, thank you for making me part of this. Um, then we start to, to shoot things with me, um, trying to be aligned with the material that I already had, but we had a problem. Uh, the scene in the car with my grandfather, Ivan, to the, to the, to, until today, doesn't have a visa, so he couldn't go to the U.S. with me, come to the U.S. with me to shoot that scene, so we, I asked another friend, who's a marvelous photographer as well and he's so i mean he he has this beautiful eye and the the the, 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 the flares and the lighting and it was so beautiful that when i shot in the in the editing room he was like he was so different from the rest of the material because he was so beautiful so what ivan and i did after that it was like trying to find a balance like trying to shoot some beautiful images, but very punctually, so we can balance the whole film to to that. So we get, so when we get to that moment, you wouldn't feel like oh this is this is so different. So that's how we find the balance, and that's what's what we try to do. Um, yeah, I, I think that's what it was. Uh, I have a question because this, uh, the, the film is deeply personal, so I, I wanted to know if, like, what do you feel, what do you feel when you rewatch the film? It depends on the days. <laughs> um, it depends on the days. Yeah, that's an honest question. Um, I don't watch it all the time. I mean, right now I didn't watch it with you. I have to confess that. Um, but at the beginning, I did try to see all the screenings and I still learn things to watch the film. Now it's a little bit hard for me to watch it because some of the dynamics inside of my family or my dynamics with some of the members of my family has changed and my perspective with some of them also has changed because that conversation was brought conversation was brought after the film and the dynamic is not the same so it's kind of hard because you tend to watch I recognize the difference from the character that I portrayed here to the people with to the perspective that I have nowadays and it is a little bit hard with some of them hasn't changed at all at all um, some of them are, some of the characters are in the same situations that I portray there. Some of them are in other different situations that makes you think like, fuck, did this film did something? Because I did it, I did it also, I wanted to make this film as well to, as I had a catharsis to bring one to my family. And there was a moment where I thought that that didn't happen, like the film didn't, didn't do nothing. But the, the, the thing is now over time I see that it has done. Um, but so and sometimes, sometimes it hits me. I mean, that last scene with my mom every time that I watch it. It depends. It depends on the mood. Oh, right. I mean, right now I just saw that. I just heard and I was like, fuck. 
I'm gonna cry. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, there are many aspects of the film that I am still like very sensitive and vulnerable. And other times that I'm like, okay, yeah. And I gave him the sun. Let's go. <laughs> no? Um, so yeah. Do you consider yourself a kind of a healer? Because I found the film to be a kind of a healing experience. And what was remarkable was the avoidance of, of making people bad characters who were truly bad characters, right? Had a way of staying objective without without turning them into the bad people, the good people, and that made, gave it more power. And I wonder if it brought healing as well. Well, I will start answering, saying that my objective when I started the film was not like not making, not pointing fingers or not trying to take these divisions of who is good and who is bad. I wanted was like I'm a human, right? And as a human, I have like many shades, right? And um, so that that's the kind of portrait that I want to make of each one of them. I consider myself a healer. <laughs> I, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, do I consider myself someone that tries to share the privilege and the kindness and the good things that I have received in my life and I want to share with other people, including my family? Yes, for sure. But I don't think, I haven't been like, I'm a healer. But I guess it could be, right? Could be. Um, right now, for instance, like, um, after the film is re the release of the film, um, I've been trying during the effort of like connecting members of my family, for instance, my, my mom with my sister, my sister with my with my grandfather's family, now with my grandfather with, with his family. And, and it's really nice to find all those bridges and all these connections and try to construct it in a way to think like, well, we are not a divided family anymore, that we can keep this united family. With some of them, I, I, I aspire that, with some of them it's like, know that it's not going to be a connection in this, I don't, I don't want to establish that. Um, hi, um, I enjoyed the movie very, very much and I'm used to watching movies. I'm not, I don't know much about filmmaking. So it's been quite a treat to watch the movie and know the Jean in, uh, as the person with his family and the filmmaker. Um, I was watching the movie and I pictured you with your phone following around um, you know, your family members and asking all these questions and then hearing you talk about having someone else filming with you. It's been quite a treat for us to get to see both sides of the whole process. I've, I feel like I've known two persons today in you, which you are both of them obviously, but it's been terrific for me. Uh, my question is, when you started uh, thinking about making the movie and you started making it and talking to the people, how much did you know about your dad, about Ochimi and the family, and how much do you discover in the process of making the movie? Um, was that it, it seems to me like you have this story, you have this, these family members, it's mostly about your dad and how that affected your, the family members and how he, he was impacted by those around him. But, did you know everything that you've presented or did you discover some, a lot? I just wonder how the movie itself impacted you in that process. I think that the, that the knowledge that had more um, power on me on the, in terms of family history was the episode of my grandfather because he, had been, he was a, an absent figure for most of my life. So when I met him, that's why it was so easy to structure him because it was a fascinating character for yeah. him and when you have that element it's like too easy i mean I, I don't know maybe i could be wrong for maybe for some people it's not uh easy but for me it was really easy to structure him because i got all this excitement and fascination and he got all these elements that he was like there done uh but with him it was like i think that 
background, that background of my family is like, it was something new to me and that was like the most powerful thing that I discovered uh, in terms of family history. In terms of my father's story, I think that what I can say is that I knew most of those things that are, are there, but something that I learned through the process is like it's very different to know than understand uh, because yeah I knew all of those things I knew what he had done um, his crimes I knew uh, his background with uh, drugs and hitting women I knew all that but when I started the film uh, and I, and I started to talk with each member of my family, what was like really hard for me that I did never saw it from that perspective, it was how normalized that conduct was inside of my family. And that was really hard. That was really hard. There was a moment where I thought like, I don't think I wanna go anymore and, and find me more, or not find me more, but I don't think I want to continue. Anyway. But it was like, no, I mean, you're, you're here now and you, you need to continue for sure. And you knew that it was going to be hard, so go for it. So, yeah. Um, so it's been understanding more than discovering. I know that the film is constructed in a way that one can think that I am discovering, but it's because, no, the truth is that I knew, but I'm just showing to you and those elements are new to you. Uh, so that's how it felt like discovering, but it wasn't a discovery. It was just like, the important thing was to understand, and that's what I did. Should we? say, but one last question we can do the answer. I really love the film. Thank you so much. How difficult that must have been. And I had a question about Christina and her involvement. I was kind of curious, when, when exactly did you hear about it? Um, how did you feel when you first learned about it? And how did you come to that very powerful uh, feeling of, you know, of understanding and forgiveness that the film is portraying the last time? I don't think you needed to include it, but also just kind of curious, like, what is your back? Well, that's, 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 um, that's a, Topic, no, the classical the question, uh, uh, don't worry. Uh, um, well, I, I met, I knew Christina when I visited my, my father, uh, when I intend to visit my father, when I used to visit my father, I saw Chris, I stay at Christina's house. I didn't say that in the film, but I stay at her house and spend weeks with her. And I had this, I cannot say that bound, but I felt that she was like a loving person. And um, and when she was in jail, I remember the one morning I took a phone call from her. She was calling from jail to my grandmother. And she sounded so peaceful and she, she didn't sound resented or anything while my dad was with another woman and he was like making his things. Uh, so I always kept this idea of Christina like a lovely woman. Then my father died and well, everybody like pointed at her and um, it was like, she was the bad one. She was the bad one in this family. And, and when I was making the film, I knew that I had to include her in the film in some way. I didn't want to reach her because I thought that that, was, it could be, that could be dangerous to me. And that's why precisely what I promised my family that I was not going to put myself or put them in danger. So that's why I tried to keep my distance from her. But I knew that I needed, I need to tell, I need to talk about her or include it in some way because she was, she was in my father's life. She was the woman that stood with my father for most years than anybody. Um, at the end, I got this courage, I don't know, it just, came to my head, like, well, if I cannot reach her, if I cannot talk to her, at least I'm gonna write her something. I'm gonna write her to let her know what I think, what I feel. And I guess that through time, while I was making this film, I was really upset with this idea of pointing someone 
at the bad and thinking as well and trying to like cover my father's responsibility you know like oh my father is a victim really i can say that in some aspects he was a victim maybe of himself of the capacities and the lags that he had emotion the emotional lags that he had yes but no one is gonna say that my father was victim of these women because i don't find it fair because he played with all of them you know and i think that nowadays <laughs> nowadays that's what most hurt me and makes me angry about him not that he killed someone which maybe i should care about but i don't know but now it's like what it makes me angry is that that uh that action of hurting women of cheating of lying it's like because I don't know. so i i wanted to take this position of like you know if everybody in this family is going to point her as the bad the bad character is like no i'm gonna stand by her side and saying that she did what i think that maybe i would do in the same position if she my father had done the same to me i'm not saying that it's good but maybe i would so i wanted to say that to her i didn't saw it as an act of forgiveness i just saw it as an act of i'm gonna take a position and i'm gonna make a status to let my family know that i am not gonna stand that someone covers others responsibilities on this so that's why and yeah sorry the most important question for sure um christina reached me when I gave her the letter, Christina reached me immediately to social media. I blocked her from Facebook before giving her the letter. So she opened another account and she texted me mm. and said like that wasn't true, that she needed to talk to me, that she loved my father very much. But I thought like, I'm not gonna call her. So when the film was released, uh, I mean, I knew, I knew that when the film was gonna, when the film get released, she was gonna find one way or another. So when the film was released in Toronto and then the film was in Mexico, when it was about to premiere in Mexico, in Guadalajara, she find out about the film and she started almost to stalking me through every social media of the film. And even if you go into YouTube and you find for videos of Komala, you're gonna see in most of them, or not saying all of them, you're gonna find a comment from Christina. And in one of them, she's like really detailed about her version of what really happened. And that got me a little bit nervous because she was really stalking. Even she was texting people from the crew uh, that participated in the film and shared something about the film. So I felt like, well, I need to talk to her, you know? I mean, if I, if, if I don't talk to her, I think that I'd be doing what my father or some other people would have done, like not facing the responsibility. So I reached her, I called her at the end of last year, and I told her that, and I thought that it was gonna be something really confrontative, but like, like, no, Christina, you're lying. And no, that wasn't true, because she was saying things that like, come on, I know the truth. And it doesn't matter, you know? But at the end, I realized that she just wanted to be here, you know? And yeah, because she loved my father, even though the, maybe the relationship wasn't like the most healthy relationship, um, she loved him and I guess that she felt offended that like, there's a film about my father and she doesn't have a voice in a way so I think that that's what upset her at the moment but then when I talked to her she's like we talked and talked and she gave me her version it was like I at the end she said I wish you the best I know that it's only a film right ha, ha, ha. and I was like yeah after all this talking that you did <laughs> you recognize that it's a film okay but yeah I don't discharge that maybe at some point she's gonna watch the film or I don't know if she watched it already but I think that if she watched it I don't know I, I don't discharge that maybe someday she's gonna put in contact again thank you so much yeah and uh, we can continue the conversation downstairs we're going to talk to you so we'll see you next week